Welcome, everyone. It's so fun to see so many faces that were in the waiting room ahead of time for this session. We have a great topic today. Um, thank you very much for joining us for this Real People, Real Talk virtual roundtable on tackling systemic bias and racism. I'm your host, Lotus Buckner. I'm the founder and CEO of LB Talent Solutions where we work with both individuals and organizations to elevate their talent potential through career coaching, including resume writing and LinkedIn profile rewrites with a personal branding focus. Um, really excited about today's guest and today's topic. Um, it's been very exciting to see all the registrations. This has been a very popular topic for us. For those of you who have been with us before, welcome back. And if you're joining for the first time to this awesome community, welcome. For um, I'll be putting into the chat, but we have three rules at all of our sessions and they're pretty simple. So the first one is be respectful and open-minded regardless of what your perspective is and your opinion. We are all here to learn and unlearn. Number two, I want everyone including our audience members, our panelists, to be completely unapologetically candid, because if we're going to actually meet our goal of learning and unlearning, we really have to have these real authentic conversations. And number three, I want everyone to have fun and let your passion on this topic spill through. It's a safe space to do so. It's really why I started these. Um, a couple logistics. All participants are going to be muted for the duration of the first hour here. Um, but I really encourage all of you to participate in using the chat function. And we usually have a great engaged audience. So I hope we have that again today. Feel free to ask questions there, either of the panelists or just of each other. And I totally encourage back channeling. You can have totally um, side conversations in the chat if you would like. It's meant to really um, help us all learn and unlearn. If you are able to stay for a few minutes after the session, our four amazing guests today have agreed to stick around for a little bit to network with you and answer any more questions that you have because this hour is going to fly by. Okay, so if you are excited and ready to get started today, type let's go in the chat, chat box for me. Let me get into the chat here so I can see all of you. Here we go. Awesome, I love it. Okay, if you would put in the chat box as well um, who you are, do an intro of yourself, who you are, what you do, where you're um, logging in from, and put your LinkedIn profiles because this is just as much about networking, so we really build a really strong community. I'm going to start with some intro so i introduced myself but i want our guests to have the opportunity to introduce themselves as well because i would not do that justice they are four truly amazing people i could not have picked four better people for this topic um so really excited to be joined by all of them jamin you want to get us started sure so jamon harrell i am a client onboarding lead at business solver uh, Really for myself, just being in this, and I won't say I've been in this DEI space for a while, but it's definitely something that has uh, kind of fallen into my lap and, and really enjoyed the opportunity to meet with folks. And, you know, thank you, Lotus, for putting us all together, because like you said, this is definitely a topic of big proportions, but definitely a place where we can have a great conversation. So looking to have a great conversation with the rest of the panelists here and see what's going on with the participants that are joining us. So glad to be here. Thank you so much. Eric, you're next on my screen. Thanks, Lotus. Um, hey, everyone. My name's Eric Kung. Um, I lead the data insights team at Volta Charging, which is a EV charging company. Um, and I also serve on the external counsel board for um, Nielsen, specifically focused on multiculturalism and diversity. I am humbled to be um, in this audience and then this group today for the conversation. I really look forward to um, the engagement ahead. Thank you so much, Eric. Jay? Hi, Lotus, and hi, everyone. Very nice to be here. I'm Jay Palaki, the founder of HR Geckos. 
Um, it's an HR technology company that is my own baby. I started about a couple of years ago. And I'm really excited to be here today um, because I brought my whole self to this conversation as Lotus demanded and mandated. <laughs> and I am looking forward to learn a lot from all of you today. So the real reason I'm here is to learn. And this is a topic that is very close to my heart. And, you know, I work at the intersection of people and technology every day. And this topic really is important as I build um, technology products for people, human resources departments, and I'm really pleased to be here. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Katie. Hi, everybody. Hello from Chicago. It is cold, <laughs> but we're trying to keep warm, and I'm really excited to be here today with everybody. Uh, my name is Katie Lopez. I am um, during nine to five, I am an HR generalist uh, for a manufacturing company in a suburb of Chicago. And then on the side, I also have my personal blog page, Latina in HR, where I wanted to document more of my stories as I navigate my career in human resources, uh, which was also kind of along the same time that I became a co-author for a book that was recently published, Latinas Rising Up in HR. And so one of the things that has just become a little bit more apparent this this past quarter or this year is just the need to kind of address and also create the spaces to have certain conversations, which is why I'm, I'm so thrilled that Lotus, you um, have honored us the opportunity to have a safe space for all of us to join this discussion. So welcome, everybody. Thank you so much. And we will, if you missed that, we will put Katie's book um, in the show notes. So we have this recorded and you can go back and watch and see the chat as well. So thanks for sharing that, Katie. So I kind of want to start the conversation with why. Um, if you, anyone has read Simon Sinek, do we have Simon Sinek fans in the audience at all? Um, I love his book, Start With Why. I think it's a a great book and I think even with this topic it's really important to talk about that so I want to kind of start there so oftentimes with diversity and inclusion efforts they get devalued or they sometimes even fail um, and they don't have the long-lasting results that we thought we would get when we went into it and so why do you think that is why do you think um, a lot of these efforts fail and why is addressing these issues from a systemic standpoint when it comes to bias and racism, really important to do. And any of you feel free to go ahead and jump in from our guests. Well, um, you know, I'd like to, um, you know, kind of try to define systemic racism versus individual uh, interpersonal racism, um, because that's something that I think I've struggled with and you know i know my little nephew struggles with and when i try to explain when he asked me to define racism for him this year he's eight years old i really struggled um, to explain what racism means to him and so that led to me trying to you know discover for myself what what systemic racism is and what what is interpersonal racism because it's easy to i think explain interpersonal racism uh, you know it's probably a flippant comment that one of mm -hmm. your schoolmates has, you know, doesn't want to have lunch with you because, um, you know, you got, I don't know, rice pilaf versus a nice um, chicken sandwich. <laughs> I don't know. It's, you know, it, these are things that you could maybe subtly explain um, to your eight-year-old. But when it comes to systemic racism, not just your eight-year-old, but your 60-year-old, how do you, how do you explain this? And, you know, to me, uh, when I started exploring this and trying to um, define what it actually means, um, I really feel that systemic racism um, needs to be defined by organizations, especially in the workplace, so individuals understand that though, um, you know, interpersonal and systemic are kind of intertwined, it's the systemic racism that is actually feeding <laughs> the interpersonal racism at work. At least that's how I feel, because um, you know, for example, you, we might have coworkers who come uh, who come to the workplace with, with a certain agenda in mind. We don't know what their agenda is, but they might have this particular agenda where 
you know, they do not want to work with you. Uh, they just they are they're just there because they want to, you know, do what they want to do, but they don't want to um, play along with you. They want don't want to play nice in the sandbox with you. And that the the fact that you are protected at work at that point is because of the systems that are in place to protect you, right? So there are laws that protect you from that kind of uh, needling behavior from your coworkers. But at the same time, um, how how are the systems uh, kind of evolving over the years as we experience this? And how how are the systems taking note of the individual experiences to evolve into better systems. Um, that, that's where, you know, my kind of thinking started forming about this topic. And um, I, I really am still learning. I'm still struggling with this topic. Um, I'm an immigrant to America. I've only lived here 20 years. Very, very, I'm a baby compared to a lot of you folks. So, um, you know, this is, this is a topic that comes up a, lo a lot in my personal and my uh, work conversations these days, of course, because of what's happening in our society. And I, I really think that we need to address this from that standpoint. We really need to be able to define what systemic racism is and help explain how systemic racism and interpersonal racism um, differs or at the same time intersects in our lives at, at work and outside of work. I think it's one way of uh, maybe a way to approach it going off of Jay is learning to understand that there are systems in place that may be outdate, outdated and in many ways <laughs> we recognize that they are outdated but one understanding that if what you have deemed as being what is the metric for the highest level of, you know, uh, C-suite positions in terms of wealth attainability and organizations, these are kind of definitions of examples where you have met and have kind of defined, and then you also have images that represent what that ideal position is. Now, when we get into a little bit more of systemic racism, that's where you have to also kind of change the, the lens shift a little bit about, okay, this is what I observe as a, as a system, and this is my anthropology studies a little bit more kicking in. It's like, what has, what are the cultural behaviors, whether it's in an organization, individually, in cultural groups and communities that have allowed for these systems to remain in place and to not allow people to come in and try to modify the vision a little bit. And so to Lotus's question, you know, why do some of these efforts fail? I think because if you have only one person who can actually understand the overall view and not be willing to put in the work to understand the multi-layers of all of these challenges, you're deemed to fail but you need to have commitment for people that are willing to do that work. Absolutely, and, and just to chime in there, I, I really do think that the systems have failed over these many, many years because we only pay lip service to any of the initiatives that we have put in place. We are very gung-ho about these initiatives at the very beginning, uh, you know, just because there, there's a lot of stuff going on out there in society, and then we just hit it on the back burner. They are never given the importance they should be given. And I've seen that throughout my career. So I think that's a great point, Jay. I think that's a fantastic point. And um, the, I, I've been thinking a lot about this topic because um, I have a six-year-old and a two-year-old, um, almost three-year-old, and they are of uh, mixed heritage backgrounds, right? My, I'm Chinese, my, my wife is a quarter Mexican and the rest um, an assortment of Caucasian. And so I've been thinking a lot about what does the future look like for my kids? And, um, and it brings me back to the idea of systemic racism and just candidly, how little progress we have made as a society. Um, and it, by the way, this is not, it, it's not unique to just the U.S. The U.S. exemplifies it because we are, um, we probably have more multiculturalism than any other country out there, um, which is an incredible opportunity for us to think about. But where I have kind of brought myself back to is this. Um, we really, in my view, we need to remove this boogeyman concept, right? This idea that 
there is the evil side who are doing these things to us, and then there is the good side that is out protesting, right? The we have to equally be vested invested into into the removal of these biases. Um, and system, there's five parts, five components of system, systemic racism that I've, I've kind of identified, which is wealth, health, housing, education, media, and criminal justice. And each of those parts, each of those components have interplay. And the idea is ultimately that until we are willing to kind of reevaluate our own judgments, our own beliefs, um, we will continue to lead into this path and we will only the only the only effort we will ever make is to point finger at someone else who we believe is doing more or is um is causing more damage to society rather than saying what am i doing how can i take a step forward to help society yeah that's a great point uh, eric because you got to walk through that and just like yourself, I've been trying to do some self actualization figure out, you know, what does it look like for me and mine? So I have nine year old twins, so four year old twins, and you know, how do we approach the world? And and then just for the sake of making sure we're inclusive here, I'm, I'm gonna use the term of people of color, uh, just so we can make sure that we're including everyone here. But when you think about that idea of system racism, and, and I think you all touched on this, is that, you know, it's the systems that are in place that perpetuate a particular idea. Uh, whatever that idea is. And it's funny because Katie and I were talking about this earlier this week and I want to paint a picture for everyone. Just so just, just think 400 plus years ago, there was this idea, right? And you had a system in place where you had people of color that were in the fields doing certain work. And you had maybe some individuals that were maybe F people of color who were leading that effort there but when you go to the owner of that field, that plantation, so to speak, right, it, it looked a certain way. And that was the family, that was the owners that you go through. So you have that picture in your mind. Then fast forward 400 years later to where we are today, who's still on the front line? As you move up the, the ladder, what does that look like? What has really changed? And what has happened is while the economics have changed, while we move past what life looked like in the 1600s, the system itself hasn't really changed. And, yeah. and, and to your point, like how, how do we break through those five points of where is that breakdown? And, and I like the way you put that, Eric, the boogeyman. What is the boogeyman that we're chasing? Why can't we do it? Especially being here in the US where there is such a melting pot of cultures. There's so many individuals with like different ideas, different ways of looking at things. But yet, as you chart through, if you're thinking it from a business world, why does it have, why hasn't that changed? Why why do we have to put in policies to change the boardroom? Why doesn't it just happen? And again, it's how do we break down that system? And that's the big question. And you know, I'm hoping by the time we get here, we at least have some nuggets as we go through it. But it's it's a tough one to crack because we're all working at it together. But I think you started off really well, though, this the why. And and if mm -hmm. we can start digging into that why, maybe we can start figuring out where we move forward with that. Yeah, I think it's so important to start there because I think we make assumptions, right, in this space. And I, I see that fail a lot. I see a lot of DNI efforts fail because we make assumptions about what the issue actually is rather than digging in to understand the root causes of these things and actually look at some of the systemic problems. We think it's that interpersonal piece that Jay had talked about, right? Mm -hmm. There's just so much assumption that goes straight there. Um, which is why I think this is so important. And I love that you all kind of defined systemic racism and bias as well. Um, before we kind of jump into solutioning, what are some of the examples that you have seen um, of systemic bias and racism, whether that's in the workplace, politics, government, kind of all of the above? Well, so I can tell you the very first example that stuck with me for the past 20 years, and I came here as a student to the United States right before 9-11, so in 2000. So it's been 20 years that I've lived here, worked here, and this is where I grew up. I was 21 years old when I came. Sorry, I gave away my age there. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't know anything about the world. I flew directly from India to Illinois, Southern Illinois University, and that's, you know, that's where I grew up. I basically grew up in the three years that I was there in that university town. And I'll tell you, the very first thing that struck me was 
when I was submitting resumes to um, my co-op programs and other um, you know, work programs through the internship program at the university, my name was a big barrier in me getting opportunities. My name is Jayanti Polaki. Jayanti means a birthday, a big celebration. And my, when I, my parents named me, they had big plans for me. <laughs> so I had to cut short my name to Jay, J-A-Y. Um, and I'm often mistaken for a Polish male because my last name is Polaki. So maybe it helped me in that way because I, I got more opportunities when I cut my name short. And I saw that play out in real life. And, you know, if you tell me systemic racism doesn't exist in America, that's my example for you. I experienced it firsthand. I totally resonate <laughs> with that one, Jay. I, so um, lots of issues that I could talk about all day um, with my maiden name. And then the second I got married, so much of that changed. And I'm married to a Black man, I, you know, but it's not a Black name like you can't you wouldn't assume that um mm -hmm. when you read my last name now but things change like the second I changed my last name from Jan to Buckner so I totally relate to that so I um I've spent a good part of my career working in media and so I am I think I'm um extra sensitive to the the design and um how media actually propagates um the the virtues of which we live with today, right? Um, being an Asian male, I and I remember very distinctly um, one of my sociologist um, professors had actually pointed this out about the depiction of Asian males in media, right? And how that actually has a a through line to ultimately how we are um, treated and how we, we are believed to behave in all throughout the rest of society. And this is, by the way, extremely true of pretty much any other um, ethnic group or um, any other subgenre of the population, right? Is that the media drives this narrative of um, who, the, who in a typical individual is, who a typical Asian American male should be, who a typical black male should be, who a typical Latina should be. And, and then we, we as individuals consume that and we believe that we, our brains have a hard time separating what we've seen on television versus what we've actually experienced in real life, right? And so to me, the starting point is how we are talking and how we are actually depicting each other. Like I, every conversation I have, and I, I actually, I engage in more conversations than I probably should, um, heated conversations with people of different um, uh, beliefs because I challenge them always to go out and meet somebody, go out and actually talk to someone who you believe is not, um, who you believe has different ideas or is not of the same ilk as you. And, and for myself, this was talking to a couple of um, Trump supporters, right? And understanding like, what is, what, what is it? What is it that about that, um, the ideals of that platform that really drive you and really kind of support um, that really hits home with you. And when you start realizing we're all just humans and we all have our own insecurities and we all kind of, the, it all ends up being, holy crap, I am completely misunderstanding the conversation. I am thinking this is what's going on when in fact, there's a whole, there's a whole avalanche of other items behind the belief that drives it all. Yeah, that's a great point, Eric. I mean, you definitely have to, we got to find common ground in certain things as, as you kind of dispel some of those myths and see, because again, what you may have seen or what you may have grown up with may not really be that reality. And a lot of that can be, a, you know, where about you grew up or like you said, what you've seen from a media standpoint. Yeah. And, and both, you know, Dan Lewis, I think it's interesting that you mentioned the name thing, because that's something that my wife and I have talked about, you know, pre mm -hmm. too often we are both judged by our names because we are, the children that we are and our parents named us what they named us they thought it was cute but forgot we had to grow up and so at the end of the day when we came up with names for our twins the first thing we always said to ourselves is are they going to be resume friendly when you get to hit that desk or i don't want them to know your background i want them to think that you are qualified based on the what's on that paper not because the name that showed up and even breaking it down to understand that 
like you said, that common ground, like where did that come from? What, what did the name that has a, an Isha in the end of it or, you know, sounds that it may be Asian, where did that come up to say that they're less qualified? Where did it come up to say that, you know, I have to take a second thought about you because of where you're from. And at the end of the day, when those resumes look exactly the same, and it's, 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 it's that conversation. And I, and I agree with you. So how do we start talking about those and really engaging in those and to have a dialogue? I mean, we don't have to agree. And, and I think too often we get in those heated arguments thinking that I'm trying to convert you here. Or you're trying to, convert. no, I think it's just, what's your point of view? What's my point of view? And we can walk away understanding each other from that point, but doesn't mean we have to agree on those points. Sounds like the name is cool. something okay. very common. <laughs> <laughs> the name thing, I swear I will, we will laugh thing I'll say about it, but like everything you guys are saying, I am just resonating to because my husband and I did the same thing with our daughter when we named her. It, like we kept thinking about that, but we also wanted a unique name for her at the same time. And so we thought we like, fat, we thought we hit it like on the Mars. We thought we had the perfect name. Her name's Liana. And after she was born, nice. was when we actually revealed her name, and every I cannot tell you how many people till this day are always like, "Huh? Why would you name her that?" <laughs> and we're like, "We thought we had it perfect." <laughs> Don't worry, I I you know along with everybody else, I struggle with my name as well, and it's actually still an ongoing conversation in my household because um, I we got hitched two years ago before Zoom weddings were cool, and <laughs> one of the first things that we talked about was the change of my last name, and in Latino culture, it is very common for the last names to be carried down as a way to remember families, and so take a pick out of my five last names and then you want to add another. <laughs> so, it, but my first name, Katie, not very traditionally Latina or Hispanic sounding. My mom named me after one of the first kids she took care of when she was a caretaker in this country. And it, it's still an ongoing conversation I have because I haven't taken the stuff to officially change it. And it feels like the compromise I have kind of been able to accept right now is to move my current last name Lopez as a middle name to tack on and honor the married the married last name I have but then officially I would be Katie Ryan on paper and you know all these conversations that you're all thinking about for your next generation the next legacy I also have to think about it how am I participating within this system itself that yeah. I am I, I'm changing it for different me reasons within my own family, but I know in a different way that the opportunities that are going to change because of how my name appears on paper is one thing. Um, I don't know how many times I have been called into interviews and surprised uh, the interview panel <laughs> that Katie Lopez is actually a Latina. They thought that I had married into a <laughs> Latinx household. And so the other system of oppression, uh, example of system of oppression, I would say is communication access, um, because that is often uh, the barrier would be just the language we speak, whether mm -hmm. it's a different dialect, a different language itself. I am bilingual in English and Spanish, and so I navigate those two worlds but I have trouble in Spanish at times because of the different dialects that I focus with populations who are either from Central America, South America, Spain, Mexico, very different to say mm -hmm. one sentence. <laughs> um, but think about that just to get one message across and now take that communication barrier within your frontline workers who, kind of back to James point, the people who you have working on the front lines and when you take a look at who's in the house who's in the c-suite why are they not there and mm -hmm. one of the first things that people are going to judge on if, once they get past your name will be the way you communicate if you mm -hmm. don't know how to speak the business lingo if you don't know how to carry yourself or present yourself based on what is acceptable and what people in the business world would want to accept it, it's um it, it's a very delicate balance <laughs> Um, I know some of you work in the HR space too, and you know we, we talk a lot about systemic racism and um, bias in kind of a lot of the recruiting processes for sure. Are there any other kind of workplace 
issues that you think people can really start with addressing from a systemic perspective that you think could make um, an impact for organizations? I kind of want to get into solutioning. Well, one, one function within human resources departments that employees go to when they have issues is the employee relations, the labor relations department. And I've worked in organizations where the employee relations representative immediately tells you that they are on the side of management, <laughs> that even if you come to them with a complaint or an issue, uh, they will be siding with management. They are not there for you. They are not an employee advocate. Mm -hmm. So here's my question. If we are human resources department and we exist to help employees within an organization, why are we an employer advocate and not an employee advocate? How do we change that within organizations? I have a startup. When I set up my startup, the very first thing I really asked myself is, if there are issues within an organization, do I want my employees to come to the HR department or do I want my employees to come directly to me? Because I want this to be a real conversation. Why do they have to go to the HR department? I'd rather handle the conversation directly as the CEO and founder of the company than you know direct them through a system of hoops Basically, it's a system of set up for employees. They do not have direct, you know, they do not have a direct pathway to management to um, address their grievances. They, they just don't. And how do we, how do we change that? It really begins with us as human resources professionals. We don't have to have a title to make this change in an organization. And, and if you think that your job is on the chopping block because you are engaging in such a conversation, then perhaps that's not the right organization for you. And, and that's where I would begin. I would begin by asking your, your immediate HR leaders, your immediate management, why is it such a difficult process for employees to even um, you know, get basic simple things addressed by management? Why is it so difficult? Why do they have to be so many hoops that they have to jump through. I understand protecting employers and, you know, protecting, uh, I'm an employer now, I, I understand protecting, you know, my, my uh, organization, but at the same time, we're all human beings, you know, we, we need to work as humans. This is, this is the 21st century. We need to change that. We really Jay, need to change that. I think that's a, I think that's a fantastic point. Um, the, I think the perspective that we take, whether it's um, as supervisors or um, as officers of the organization, makes a big impact on how we go about responding, right? And um, what I mean by that is this, we, when we think about um, diversity training, I think most organizations think about it from a position of liability avoidance, right? It is, we need to check this box or else we may get sued. or. Um, or the alternative is it's a punitive, um, kind of punitively based approach of, you know, if you cross this line, you're going to get in trouble, right? Instead, and from my experience in working with cor in corporations, the only way things really get done is if you can draw a through line between the action and company welfare. What I mean by that is um, for when my company, uh, when we recruit, if you refer, qualified candidates and the candidate comes into the organization stays for six months, um, they, you get rewarded for it, right? And that is because we want to bring in more qualified or higher levels of talent. We should do the same if we can think about multiculturalism as a, an incentive that helps drive company value or that helps drive enterprise value. And we, I don't know that we've done a good enough job of explaining why, why multiculturalism, why bring in um, diverse opinions and diverse workforce actually can help a company grow and develop. Yeah, that's a great point. And I, and I think too often we've fell in that ex excuse in some corporations on, I can't find diverse talent. And, and we always challenge that is, are you fishing in the same pond? You know, you need to, if you're going to look for diverse talent, you got to go where diverse talent lies, right? So you have organizations that come back and say, you know, I can't find, you know, 
people who are people of color, well, are you going to the schools that they go to? Are you tapping into the networks that they're tapping? You have to make that mind shift change to go look for that diverse talent and not just stay in the same place thinking it's going to be there. And it, it's, it's interesting because I think, especially when you get to the, say, the higher positions, you already have narrowed the pool, right? Because mm -hmm. people of color are not typically there. And you're wanting to find someone that has the 10 years worth of experience though, you know, all the accolades are going there, but they haven't had that opportunity. They haven't been put in that position. So is it also looking at it from potential, right? We're always looking for high potentials. Those that are willing to be able to make a mark, say in that organization. So do you take a chance on that person that has the qualifications, the aptitude to drive, but maybe hasn't held that position for a while and, and really starting that conversation right there and, and I think from a HR and I think someone put it in the chat it's like how do you put your equity lens on right yeah. we've the diversity we're, we're getting pretty good at you know we're starting as in which we're we have diverse places you definitely see in multiple people but where's the equity you know mm -hmm. where where is it that when Eric you walk in the room and I walk in the room that we are evaluated based on can we get the job done it isn't a matter on what you look like or what I look like it's hey Eric has he has the skill set I'm looking for. He's our guy, you know, yep. and same thing, you know, Jay and Katie, they, you walk into the room, it shouldn't be given to the man per se, who has the best looking experience. That's who takes us forward and makes it go through. And, and we all know that diverse, the more diverse organizations are, they're going to outperform those that are not. I mean, Absolutely. we, there's research that just goes on and on about that. And so now it's, how do we get it, get it practiced, get it going through and work through it. Absolutely. Greg also shared in the chat um, that one of his clients, they're looking to a, an employee referral program right now where they actually pay a higher referral bonus for diverse candidates. So that's a great way to kind of put your money where your mouth is. I also think that's a great solution to a systemic problem, right? Because referral bonuses in itself, not, not in every organization, but in most, I would argue, can be a systemic problem because to your point, Jim, on you're bringing in then people from the same pool that look like you, that act like you, that have the same experience as you, the same education as you, and you're never getting outside of that pool. So that within itself is a great example of a systemic problem and how that can really be resolved. Um, I also have to say, I love that you use the phrase, you know, take a chance on people because you know, if all you're looking for experience requirements, education requirements, all of those are systemic issues too with the way we're hiring people. We do have to take chances on people. And one of the solutions I've seen that I'm a little bothered by um, ever since the aftermath of George Floyd, right? We see a lot of organizations who've jumped onto the bandwagon of diversity mm -hmm. and inclusion efforts. And one popular one is they're building this mentor program where they're bringing in um, diverse candidates at the lowest level of their organizations and saying, we're committing to growing them into higher positions. Well, what about you just take a chance and put them at an equitable position to others so that you have diversity in your leadership? Because we need quicker avenues to get there. We can't, it doesn't help to just bring people, diverse candidates in at the lowest level, pay them the lowest, um, positions in the entire organization. Well, for sure. And I think that's, that's the challenge, right? Is mm -hmm. How do you, how do you fit that mold to get through that? Because there has been the best way to put it. Yes. You've had to see everyone that making claims are going through. And I think time is going to tell on those that have made the false claims versus those that are truly sticking by what they're going to do. And I know one of the things that we've done at our organization, you know, we basically had to raise your hand who's in, in it to, you know, they take this diversity work, who's in it to have the conversation. And we had, you know, like 90, 90 people who said, you know what, sign me up and we're ready to do it. And we're going together through a book club on the, uh, the book, uh, Subtle Acts of Exclusion and mm -hmm. having real conversations between ourselves to figure out, okay, now how do we branch this out to the rest of our organization? How do we start kind of grassroots get it out there. And luckily we have executive support, which is making it even better. So we're having that safe space to have those conversations. And, you know, over the last four months in doing this, 
I mean, we're asking questions and questions are popping up that I don't think ever would have popped up before. I mean, someone would have never asked that type of question. And and to kind of take it back to so it's like organizations, you know, why you're trying to make it look diverse, just make it diverse. And they said, let's yeah. start there and start working through that. And again, take the chances on the individuals, but at the same time, there are qualified individuals out there. Uh, you just got to go find them and you got to be a front and center. And I like that that idea of the bonus. So, hey, if you bring a diverse candidate, there's a higher pool because I guarantee someone knows someone diverse. I think one of the challenges that I deal with is when I can identify skills that exemplify great leadership amongst diverse employees, but getting them to believe it. Mm -hmm. because as much as I'd love to be able to reinvest back within the organization, an employee who is struggling to, um, I guess, maybe dream or believe that they could get that kind of leadership that we, you know, the goal for the organization is to provide more equitable opportunities for more diverse employees. But if you have your internal population that you have certain key employees that you like to retain, but they're they're not able or they have a fear of taking that leap what is a way that we can do to or what are things that we can do to kind of coach them and develop them throughout those stages to kind of get them ready for that um i know that there's also value in recruiting externally uh, but sometimes there are internal employees to address that with uh, but i think that's the opportunity for more of an ongoing conversation with that employee with the basis like hey you know let's talk about why you didn't um, express interest for a management position or do you have interest for this and what do you feel like it's holding you back you think you don't have enough presentation skills or you don't know the subject enough no worries we're going to start creating an action plan for that so that in six months we're going to reevaluate this again and see where you're at to see how much closer we can get you to this position uh, creating that action plan and actually staying motivated and, and on track with it and, and that's the key, right, Katie, that, that action plan creation is the first step, but keeping up with that plan on an ongoing basis, not just periodically, every three months, six months, a year, no, every day. How are we helping this employee? How are we coaching this employee to be that leader? And we need to have that conversation every day in our organization. It's not going to wait for a year. It shouldn't wait for a year because this is urgent, right? And, and I've seen this play out, Lotus, where you said, you know, how are we taking these employees and not placing them at an equitable position within the organization? Um, my very first mentoring program where I was the mentee <laughs> was very uh, enlightening to me where I was told, yes, you are part of this mentoring program where we are gonna help you develop, but then that's it. You know, when it comes to the opportunities in the company, you compete with everyone else in the same manner. You, there is not going to be, uh, you know, uh, um, you're not going to get a leg up just because you were part of the mentoring program. So then why did you have a mentoring program in the first place when you were trying to, um, you know, diversify your organization? What was the point? We need to stop checking the boxes. Yeah, it, it was just a checking a box. I... Absolutely. Angelica brought up something um, in the chat and that, I, I, that really resonated with me. She said, um, I think we need to redefine what professionalism is. Um, that rang true to me because I think a lot of times we uh, as organizational leaders have a cookie cutter um, image of who a leader should be or who, who this person, um, we kind of personified the role based on what we are familiar with, right? And so when we talk about mentoring and when we talk about guiding, um, I think it's important absolutely to identify cultural norms and understand individuals and the individuality of, of everyone, right? And what might be causing them to be a little bit more timid or what might be, you know, maybe just the, their upbringing that they are kind of different in that cultural background. Um, and I think we need to stop believing that there is only one size that fits the position we're hiring for. Because um, I myself am only a result of someone who was willing to take a chance on me. I was not, um, I was not the cookie cutter candidate for the role that I first got into media. I was not the, I didn't come from USC. I did not have the, 
the vast amount of internship background in order to get to my position. I, but I came in, I interviewed for the role and my boss, my manager at that time, listened to what my thoughts and the, what I was able to bring in a diversity in opinion that then allowed me to get into that role and bring greater value and equity to my organization and to my department. And I think that's, it is so important for us to do the work and not again, to Liz's point, don't just check the box, let's do the work. Yeah, and I think that's where it's important of the allies and sponsors coming to play. You know, there's just things that those of us people of color, we just can't get past. And so it's gonna take an ally, it's gonna take a sponsor that's going to be say, you know, and I always like to define allies and sponsors different, you know, allies, the person that's inviting you to that table, uh, but that sponsor is a person that's gonna give up their seat and let you sit down. And having those individuals that are able to walk alongside you, whether it's a designated mentor or just a mentor on the side that's gonna help there. If we really wanna break down this idea of systemic racism and really break that system, it's going to be up to our allies and sponsors to start shattering some status quo, start looking at on, you know what, there's Jamon over there. He has an opportunity. I want to bring him to the table. And let's get back, you said, Eric, that diversity of thought. Let's look at something a little bit differently. I believe in him to do that. Or, you know, there, there's Katie. She's doing a great job here. But you know what, let's take that beyond that. Let's stretch and push and like you said, walk alongside to ensure that we're getting there because you're right, this idea of professionalism has had this look, you know, it looks a certain way, but we all know just looking at all the organizations we're doing here, it's not that way in reality. There's different ways to approach it. There's different ways to do it. Different people respond to different things. And again, if, if we're gonna solution, allies and sponsors, I, I'm a firm believer because there's only so much I can do by myself. I am absolutely. Good. I love that you brought up sponsorship. I think people also mix yeah. up sponsorship and mentorship, and sponsorship is actually actionable and results driven, and you can actually push people there faster. Sure. Absolutely, and and uh, you know, Jaman, you bring up a very uh, important point. Um, when I was part of the mentoring program, and and I'm sharing this. Um, you know, I was looking for sponsorship. I was not looking for a mentor. I knew what my capabilities were. I knew what I brought to the table. I knew my game was better than everyone else that I was competing with. Frankly, I'm not trying to sound overconfident, but I knew what my professional abilities were. I didn't need that kind of coaching. I needed a sponsor. I did not have those network connections within the organizations, those um, sorry to say, but the clickish connections within the organization to go up the ladder, I needed a sponsor. I didn't need a mentor. And so the organization failed me there and I left basically <laughs> because I didn't see any growth there. I didn't see a future there. Um, and these, these conversations, they don't happen at work. We talk about DEI and I was talking to someone the other day and they don't like the acronym because some of them are using the acronym, you know, they intersperse the letters of the acronym and it sounds D-I-E versus D-E-I and, and, and they're like, who are you trying to kill here? It's not D-I-E, it's D-E-I. But even then, the, the whole acronym and the way we frame the conversation around this important topic that affects our lives, you know, it's not just our professional lives, it affects our personal lives. How are we framing these conversations at work um, and, and bringing the sponsors uh, to, to the fore where they are your champions? So I, I define a sponsor as someone who has your back even when you're not there in the room. So if, if, there is, if you have a sponsor in the organization, they are there, uh, you know, talking about your capabilities and pitching you to the organization as the next leader. That's the sponsor. A mentor, on the other hand, is your coffee chat once a week. It's not helpful, sorry, <laughs> doesn't work for me. I'm sure it doesn't work for a lot of folks who already know where they are uh, in terms of their capabilities and abilities. And, and this is a conversation that needs to change. We, in, inside the organization, inside the safe space, why are we not having these conversations? And what are our human resources leaders um, thinking about when they set up these safe spaces, you know, how are they creating these safe spaces? What is the agenda that they have in mind? And is that agenda framed on their own experience? Because 
who is the leader who is putting together the DEI initiative or the, the equity initiative at your organization? What are their personal experiences that shape the workplace, um, you know, the strategy that they're building? Because it plays a big part. I'm, I, I can tell you my personal experience plays a big part in how I shape uh, projects at work uh, around equity, around diversity. Definitely, I, I'm a human being. I mean, my unconscious biases do play out. And am I having these conversations? No, I don't have a place to have these conversations yet. I don't think I do. I mean, we still have a long way to go when it comes to these conversations. I mean, the conversation we're having right now to me is also very superficial. It's not deep enough. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you know, it's not deep enough for me. I, it, we need to delve deeper. Uh, it, this just doesn't work anymore. I think the challenge in there and just being able to bring the conversation into a workplace is that, again, going back to professionalism, it's a topic that you don't talk about um, because you don't bring those issues into the workplace. And again, how HR can be involved in it is that if you are defined to represent the organization and prevent it from liabilities and lawsuits, that in itself, you've already closed off the conversation. You're, you'll never get into the depth of the conversation. Um, I keep thinking about Eric's point about multiculturalism. We're living in a country that has so much multiculturalism and that in itself already is conflicting because you have so many groups of different cultural beliefs, of traditions, of all this richness that need to learn how to coexist. And sometimes it's not just about ignoring it and figuring out ways to work around it. It's about actually just having the space to address like, hey, these are the challenges that we are facing within our group here because of these challenges. And we're gonna take some time to actually address about, you know, the problems we have about, um, the communication style here or the lack of education that maybe we need for this kind of opportunity, taking that kind of moment to talk about in a workplace, but people will be afraid to do it because out of fear of not saying the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, about not being educated enough to talk about it, about not being the expert about it. And we're not here to say that you need to be the expert about it. It's that you need to be open-minded to listen and not automatically respond at all times, but to listen to the different perspectives that people are bringing to the problems that you need to acknowledge are happening in a workplace. Yeah, Katie, just to add I on that, and that. Um, I'll put a capitalist spin on this. Um, I remember when I was working at a, a television network, um, the, the majority of the individuals I worked around were cauc Caucasian. I mean, um, TV industry has been pretty, was pretty segregated for quite a while. And it was around the time where um, there was starting to be a developing market for, um, for marketing towards Latinx um, population. And there was so many really awkward conversations about how do we actually talk to these people because we had we didn't have any hispanic representation within the organization right so like if if you think about it strictly from a business standpoint you're talking about it, a lack of understanding of your own consumer base presumably right if you don't and that's where um, that's where I think a lot of organizations are short sighted is that it's not just about hurt feelings. It's not just about, quote unquote, the woke culture. It's about understanding what your total addressable market is and actually doing the work so that you can you can really maximize your potential as an organization. Absolutely. All right, I told you all that this hour would fly by. And to Jay's point, there is not enough time. Um, we can continue talking about this really important topic um, for the rest of the day. Um, but I know all of you have jobs to get back to. So I want to close in um, thanking Jaman, Eric, Jay, and Katie for your time and your knowledge and your sharing and your openness today and your vulnerability. I, again, could not have picked four better guests to really have this conversation with. Um, it sounds like we need to do it again. Everybody's messaging me that as I'm looking on the screen. So we might need to have a part two, it sounds like. Um, but also thank you to all of the participants today. You have been so engaging in the chat. I could not keep up, which is weird for me. I usually can, but you all are going so fast and I appreciate your engagement and your insights there as well. So I'm excited to have some weekend reading um, as I go through that. Please, please, please go register now for our next roundtable. 
on living and breathing allyship. So I know that was briefly brought up today, but we're gonna dive deeper into that topic on January 22nd. And I'll be joined by four, another, another four amazing guests, Tracy Sponnenberg, Zach Nunn, Rebecca Edwards, and Sarika Lamont. So go check out um, that event at lotusbuckner.com slash events. Excited to see you there. I'll put it in the chat for you as well. Thank you all again, and we'll see you January 22nd.